Well, good morning, everyone. It's great that we have a chance to connect together and just want to add my word of welcome to you today. My name is Phil Rushton, the lead pastor here at BCC, and grateful for the opportunity for us to now come before the Word of God, and my hope is that this would speak to us in some profound ways today. So I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 4. We're going to read verses 35 through 41. You'll see it up on your screen, but if you have your Bible with you, you might want to follow along. So let's listen in to the Word of God. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. And a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion and the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Would you join me in a word of prayer? God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that you might meet us today in whatever storm or fear that we are carrying and that you might speak a word of peace. Uh, So Lord, open our hearts to receive your word today, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, we're continuing this week on, in the series on the questions that God asks us in Scripture. And the question that I want to invite us to reflect on today, it comes up in this text, which is this question, why are you so afraid? I think this is a, a timely question for us, uh, for I suspect that many of us come today carrying a number of fears and worries This has been an anxious year for many of us as we continue to navigate this pandemic and are a bit uncertain about how things might end. We've just come through a very politically anxious week as a country. And others of us perhaps are bringing some worries, some fears that are closer to home, whether that's the fears uh, for our children, for our health, for our jobs. Fear and anxiety is just one of those common human experiences that we share, and the scriptures anticipate this. One commentator counted up that there are over 365 commands in scripture to not be afraid, which suggests that we almost need one of those a day. And this is just this regular reality that we face as human beings that we carry. We we pick up those fears and those anxieties. My hope is that this question and and the scripture might give us some space to dig a little deeper about what's behind some of those fears, to, to name them a bit today. But more than that, my hope is that we might discover where God is at in those fearful places and that we might discover some hope today. So we pick up the scene with the disciples crossing the lake that are caught up in what is named a furious squall. And their fear is very obvious in this scene. They are fearful for their life. This must have been quite the storm for some seasoned fishermen to act with such panic. For us to maybe understand the emotional space there, and maybe we could just picture ourselves right now listening to this sermon on an airplane with the engines that have just fallen off. That's the the intensity of the scene where they are filled with fear for their life. And into that scene, we encounter this question where Jesus asks, why are you so afraid? I don't know about you, but when I first read this question, I found myself bristling at the question a little bit. Why is Jesus asking this? It seems like it's pretty obvious, and it would seem that fear would be a normal response. Are we supposed to have nerves of steel and be these stoic superheroes that aren't uh, overcome by fear? What's behind this question? 
As, I, as I've been digging deeper into this text, I realize that Jesus isn't passing judgment, per se, on our fear, but inviting us into a deeper place of reflection. I notice that he doesn't ask the question, what are you scared of, but why are you afraid? And those are two different questions. For example, a lot of people are fearful of uh, public speaking, and when asked, what are you afraid of, that might be the answer. But the why question goes deeper. What might be behind a fear like that? Is it a fear of rejection or failure or embarrassment? I think in this text, Jesus is asking us to look a little bit more deeper about what's actually at the root of our fears. Now, this is a complicated thing. There's a lot of things that lie at the, the root of fears. Sometimes it's just learned behavior or we're responding out of our own history of trauma. Sometimes there's a physical reality to it. But in this text, Jesus suggests that sometimes at the root of our fear is a persistent distrust that God will come through for us. Do you notice in the text that he pairs two questions together? Why are you so afraid? And do you have, do you still have no faith? Now again, I don't want to oversimplify this, and I think fear is complicated, but at times I think when we dig deeper behind our fear, there is still this question, is God going to pull through? Can I trust God in the various storms that I am facing? Thomas Merton is a great spiritual writer from the 20th century, and he once wrote that anxiety is a sign of spiritual insecurity. That behind our anxiety often, not all the time, but often, is there's this still persistent insecurity about who God is and whether God is trustworthy. I remember sharing that quote with a friend of mine, and he said, yeah, that's interesting, but I don't think Thomas Merton ever had children. And so he kind of pushed back a little bit on that. There's other reasons for fear beside this, but I think there's something significant in this observation. Parker Palmer is another uh, significant writer and thinker. And I've always been struck by this observation that he has that was initially spoken in the context of Christian leadership. And he said that a lot of Christian leaders, pastors, teachers, and so on, live as what he calls our functional atheists. What he means by this is that while we proclaim faith and we give lip service to our faith, we often function as if God isn't who we really say he is. And so in the context of leadership, while we believe that God is in control, we often act as if we're really in control, and all the problems that we are facing are things that we need to carry. And so we work ourselves to the ground, and we're overcome by worry because we we function as if God isn't actually there for us. I'm wondering if that maybe names something for us. Because you see, I think the purpose of this question is to invite us to go deeper and discover whether there is some trust that needs to be rebuilt between us and God. The good news that I want to discover in this text and proclaim is that there are signs all through this text, but I believe that we can also trace in our lives that can help us rebuild some of that trust, that we can discover a sense of peace even in the midst of the various storms that we are navigating in this particular season of life. So I notice a few things that I think give us some encouragement, some trust-building realities in this story. And the first thing that I wanna just name from this story is that just because we are facing a storm does not mean we are outside of the will of God. There's a detail in this text where it says in verse 35 that Jesus initiates this journey which leads them into the storm. He says, let us go to the other side. Let us go to the other side. When they hit the storm, they are in the middle of a God-ordained journey. There's a, a lot of references to the Jonah story in this text. A lot of commentators notice that this is almost a replaying of the Jonah story. We'll recall that Jonah was sent to the other side to go and proclaim to the Ninevites the good news of who God is, and he was reluctant. And on his journey, he was in a boat, and he was down below asleep 
right? And we see that Jesus is almost like this new Jonah who's fulfilling this role more perfectly, that he continues the journey. You see, the geography of this story is uh, calling the disciples to go to the other side where the Gentile people live. Jesus is leading these disciples on an important journey, just like Jonah, to go and bring good news to those who have been seen as excluded from God's plan. Jesus wants to use them to bring good news, to break down these barriers of ethnic, um, ethnic contra- uh, conflict. And so they're on an important journey. I think it's significant for us to just remember that when we face storms, it doesn't mean that we are outside of the will of God. That there's a call here for us to disabuse ourselves of this notion that just because things are hard must mean I've somehow missed the path that God wants me on. You see, I think that's sometimes part of the anxiety that we feel. So for those of you who are teachers right now who are having a hard year, I want to encourage you to know that just because it's hard doesn't mean you are somehow outside of God's plan or that you have missed your calling. Or if ministry or life is hard, it doesn't mean that you are outside of God's will. You see, I think half of our anxiety is around this thought that maybe we have missed the path. C.S. Lewis has a, a really helpful analogy that helps us understand the connection between anxiety and expectation. And so he says, imagine you are going to a hotel and you are expecting the honeymoon suite. But when you turn the key and you enter in, you find that you're actually in this really basic hotel room. It's just a bed, a mini fridge, and an old TV. And you'll be discouraged because it's not what you were expecting. But imagine now that you are told that you are going to a jail cell and you enter that same room, you will be delighted at even the most modest comforts. There's a bed and a TV and a mini fridge, right? I think that sometimes as Christians, we have been told to expect the honeymoon suite, if you will. There are some distortions of the gospel that say that when we give our life to Jesus, we should expect health and wealth and things should be good for us. And then when we hit the inevitable storms that come our way, we can find ourselves wondering, are we outside of the will of God? But the scripture reminds us, as Jesus says elsewhere, that in this world we will face trouble, but to take heart, I've overcome the world. That maybe one of the ways we can rebuild some trust is just knowing that when things are hard, we are still in the plan of God. And so I think that's a trust building thing. The second thing that I notice that I think can encourage us in these various storms and speak to our fear is that God is also present with us in the storm. We see that Jesus is on the boat with him, with the the disciples. This is a a beautiful biblical truth that we see reaffirmed throughout the scriptures. As the psalmist has said in Psalm 23, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will not fear. Do not fear, God says, for I will be with you. And we see that Jesus is present with these disciples. Now at first he is sleeping, and this causes them some anxiety, but we notice that his slumber causes them to seek him more fervently. It calls them to a deeper prayer, and they beckon Jesus to awaken, and he responds to that prayer, and he comes to bring some calm and some peace. And I wonder if one of the reasons why God might even allow us to go through these storms is that it might call us to a deeper level of pursuing God, of seeking to awaken the Christ that lies within our hearts that perhaps has been slumbering, that we have maybe ignored. There's a call here to prayer and and a hopeful word that God hears us when we call upon him, that he is with us in the storm. Can you trace that in your experience at all? where God has been that present help, even in circumstances that have felt overwhelming. The last thing I I want to notice that I think helps rebuild some trust. First, we've said that we're still in the will of God, (laughs) that God can redeem these things, that God is present with us. But I think this text also 
calls us to see the various storms we are facing from a bigger perspective. That what seems daunting and overwhelming actually does not have the final say on our life, that there is a deeper hope beyond the waves, beyond the storm. For we see illustrated in this text that we have a God who is more powerful than the things that we fear, more powerful than the things that we are up against. Jesus has the capacity to honestly say we do not need to be afraid because he sees beyond the temporary suffering and knows that there is a different future in store for us. I was thinking of an experience uh, from a couple years ago when our twins were just babies and it was the first time that they got really sick. I remember holding Nate and he was just miserable. He had a stuffy nose and a sore throat and for a couple days he was just crying consistently. And he was miserable, we were miserable, everyone was miserable. (laughs) But I remember holding Nate and, and just trying to soothe him and I even said, the words that came out of my mouth said, don't be afraid, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. But I realized from this little infant's perspective, he had no idea if it was gonna be okay. This was the first time he'd experienced this. For all he knew, this was this new reality that has set in and things were scary and overwhelming and he didn't know the other side of the story. From my vantage point as as a parent, I've been through hundreds of colds and flus and know that while this is a, a temporary struggle, there's gonna be another part of the story. He doesn't need to worry. There will be a better day ahead. But I was just mindful of that experience as how perhaps we might see ourselves in relationship to our Heavenly Father. That from our vantage point, sometimes things seem like the end of the story, overwhelming, insurmountable. But can we trust that our Heavenly Father has the reason to say we don't need to be afraid because he sees a bigger perspective that the the current storms we face will not be the end of our story. In fact, that's what we point to, and, and, and that is the hope that we have in Scripture, that we have a God who faces even death itself and comes through on the other side, that we worship a God of resurrection. May that hearten us when the storms seem too large, when we feel overwhelmed, that God has the credibility and the capacity to say we don't need to be afraid. Yes, in this world, we will face hard things. And sometimes the storms aren't even calmed right away. Paul, for example, faced a shipwreck. (laughs) But the good news of our scripture is that we will never face harm that is beyond the hope of redemption. Irredeemable harm will never befall those of us who are held in the hands of God. That's a quote from Dallas Willard, I love that. We will face harm, we will face struggle, but it will never be beyond the hope of redemption. I notice one thing at the end of this text that I I wanna end with today. It says in verse 41 that after they have this experience of God commanding the waves and the wind to be still, that they were terrified. (laughs) Other synoptic gospels use the word astonished. But what what I notice here is that what's happening is that as they are discovering the power of God, that fear of God or that awe or reverence of God has the capacity to drive out the fear they have of the circumstances they are up against. I want to read a a quote from Proverbs 19.23 where it says that the fear of the Lord leads to life, then one rests content, untouched by trouble. This word for fear of the Lord does not mean, as one writer said, that God is awful, but that we ought to be awful, filled with awe, that God is more powerful than the things we are up against. May we rediscover that, and may that give us courage and hope to navigate the various storms that we are going through. So I invite you this week to prayerfully wrestle with this question, why are you so afraid? And as you do so, my prayer is that you might discover again 
that we need not allow fear to overwhelm us, for we have a God who is with us and a God who is more powerful than the things we fear. Would you join me in prayer? God, I do pray that you would meet us even now in this moment, in this space, as we navigate these fearful circumstances. And may you restore to us a deep awareness of your presence with us and your power and your strength. May you give us courage that whatever we face now is not the end of the story. We pray this in your name. Amen.